Good morning. Let's get started. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone, for coming this morning. Everyone's catching up. That's good. So, good morning. Welcome back. It's good to see everyone. Absolutely. I, I kind of missed you guys. I haven't seen the campus was a little bit empty. Now it's good to see everyone back. And speaking of being back, our students came in the last two days. And I can't tell you how thankful I am of all the, the hundreds of volunteers that helped our students move in to the residence halls. More than 20, about 25, 2,600, I guess, that moved in. And I, was, I had the opportunity to do a little bit of work myself, but I also had a lot of chance to talk to families during that day. And I kept on hearing things like, I feel safe, I can go home, I can leave my baby here, okay? People are so nice around here. And if you caught the vibe and the atmosphere, it was absolutely tremendous. And this picture kind of captures that. <laughs> it, was, it was a great, great environment. And it went off without a hitch. And Thomas Newsom, Michael Stark, and those folks deserve a, a, a very round of applause and thanks for that. <clears throat> I, I also want to, uh, uh, Officer Cato was in the middle there, did a bang up job. I hope he's not here, because it's just, it's just going to feed the beast if I say that. But, you know, so oftentimes our UPD folks have a tough job, oftentimes, okay? And oftentimes we don't get to see this side of them. And I often get to see this side of them. So Chief, Chief uh, Vaughn, thank you for everything you do. And uh, thank, you, thank you so much for UPD being great citizens. So thank you very much. <clears throat> So we have uh, uh, just a couple important people in the audience. And I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, someone very important to this university. And that, that is my predecessor, uh, President Ray Keck. And he's back. Ray, are you somewhere around here? There he is. Thank you very much, Ray. Well, welcome home. Welcome home. So thank you very much. Um, i also like to acknowledge uh, two very important people that I got to know over the last year since I've been here uh, that have rapidly become, I feel like they're friends of mine, and they've, they've been such great advocates of this university, great ambassadors of this university, have, and have given their f resources, time, and energy to the university, and that is Buddy and Debbie Barnes. D could you stand up real quick and can we just say hi to you? <clears throat> Um, I would also like to uh, thank Amanda Brown for helping me put this together today. It was, it was thanks for everything. I couldn't have done this without, without Amanda. So this, thank you, Amanda. So this is going on the wall somewhere in my office or somewhere. Uh, you, better, you better believe it. Um, we, have, we have a number of new faces, new people, or same people moving into the different positions and so forth. First of all, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome all the new faculty to the university, to the Lyon family. I know you can't make this out. I wish I could make it a lot bigger. But what always impresses me is that we, we continue to ramp up the folks we are getting and attracting to this university. You're finding names like Iowa State, University of Nebraska, University of Missouri, the private sector on this list. And I can't tell you how impressive this list is this year and throughout the last many, many years to reach where we are with the great faculty we have today. So new faculty, welcome to the Lyon family. <clears throat> we also have a large number of new staff at the university. 
Staff, I, I've told you this before, that in, many, in my previous jobs, I worked primarily with staff. And I can't tell you how important you are to this university. And you will continue to be important to this university. So all the new staff members, thank you for selecting uh, a and Commerce. And again, welcome to the university. <clears throat> Now, my, I've been here a year, and I've, I've said this a number of times, and my family is here today. Uh, we sit around the dinner table, or we sit around the TV, and we talk about, oftentimes, how this first year has been great for us, and how welcoming the folks of East Texas and a and Commerce have been to my family. And you've probably read this before, but if you take care of my family, you take care of me. And I can't tell you how appreciative I, I am of that. And uh, my son came out from Boise, he graduated from Boise, he's working up there. He came down here, and uh, Libby and I are so excited because our son is saying, started asking questions, now, what are the job opportunities down here? Where can I find an apartment and so forth? And Libby and I are going, yes, we gotta get him down here. So anyone who has any uh, connections, networks with computer science and cybersecurity, let us know, we, he's, a, he's a top notch guy. So I can't wait to get him down here. I also like to introduce a couple of of, again, new faces, new places, and so forth. Uh, we have launched a new college, College of Innovation and Design, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more, a little bit more in depth, but also have that discussion with the campus community as we proceed through the year. I feel like we have found the perfect person for this position. And I've had experience in launching these type of efforts at my previous jobs. I guarantee you she is the right person. So, Yvonne, thank you so much. I don't know where she is, but thank you so much for taking this on. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Madeline. Madeline has stepped up to serve as the new interim dean for the College of Education and Human Services. We can't tell you how excited we are about that. Madeline, welcome. Thank you very much for your uh, service to the university. Another tremendous addition to the campus is our new executive director of communications and marketing, who fortunately has inherited a very, very talented and committed team over in Marcom, and that's Michael Johnson. He comes to us from Sullivan. He has some great ideas. I think he's right on the cutting edge of where we need to go and how we tell our story, both in print and in social media and so forth. So Michael, you're, you're around here somewhere. Welcome to the university. New face. <clears throat> now I had a, I had a, I introduced Matt, I think at previous uh, assemblies, but he is not. He, I don't think he made it the previous assembly, so I wanted to make sure I had a chance to do it again. Matt works for the system, but we're calling him a lion. Okay, he is he is our government liaison for the legislature and any matters government relations wise. And fortunately, Matt is here today. Matt, can you stand up and just wave your hand and say hi? Thank you. Uh, we also have a new women's and men's golf coach, Lauren Mason. I spent five minutes with, oh, actually about a half hour with this person. I was so impressed. She fits the mold of, the, of what we expect in our coaches in terms of student success. I hope you get a chance to meet Lauren. She is not here today. She's out coaching or, I, actually she's from Australia. She's down in Australia working on some things and she'll re be returning soon here. She can't join us today, but I guarantee, if you ever get a chance to meet this, this woman, please do. You'll be super impressed. So, uh, Lauren, welcome to the university. And then we have our new president of SGA, Kelsey Deckard. Also, very, where is Kelsey? Kelsey, you're supposed to be here. Hey, no, oh, come on. This is, this is Kelsey Deckard here. Thank you for coming. Very impressive, I believe a biology major. Still trying to talk her into getting her advanced degrees here. I need some help in doing that. But I, I feel like SGA is in great hands, okay? And one of the things we've been t I've been talking to Kelsey about and her predecessor about is how do we become more engaged in student government, our campus, right? I, I attend SGA uh, meetings. Thomas Newsom is a regular there and so forth. But these students are begging to hear what's going on across campus. 
And I've challenged and asked the deans, but I could, I could make this across the board, VPs, department chairs, whoever that is, I think they would tremendously benefit, and I've heard it myself, they would tremendously benefit if you just gave them 10 minutes of your time and gave them a briefing on ag, or gave them a briefing on health and human performance. They, that would be extremely welcomed by them. I, I would also mention this, I won't dwell too much on this, but um, we always have to be mindful of why we're here. We are here to serve and help our students be successful. And part of that growth, part of that development of the students are, is outside the classroom. And so we have to take every, I think, I believe that we may need to take every effort we can to participate in student events. Libby and I are regulars at student events, maybe three, four times a month. And the students take note who's there and who's not there. And so we'll discuss this, and this is something I need to, I want to talk to SGA about and be partners in this, because it's a two-way street. How do faculty and staff understand when the events are and so forth? We need to do some work in that area. But I would ask each and every one of you to maybe work hard and set a goal of maybe attending at least one student event a month throughout the academic year. It would be tremendously uh, received by our student body, okay? Okay. Announcements. First announcements. I thought I was going to forget this. Fortunately, I didn't. The Pride Walk is right after this. Okay? My understanding is we are not going to line up on this sidewalk. We're going to line up out this way, and I think the students are going to come around and walk by the Victory Bell and come in here, and we're going to line up this way. So fortunately for you, because I don't know what I'm talking about here, going to, there's going to be people that are going to be able to guide you and help you out where to set the line and welcome our new students in, into this auditorium as their first walk as a lion on campus. So I appreciate you all sticking around and playing, playing a part in that. So some just announcements, very eclectic group of announcements here. Okay, I, I did want to make a mention that we, uh, on September 19th, we are going to host a renowned sociologist, um, Dr. Arlie Russell Hochschild who comes from us from UC Berkeley. And one of our uh, alums, Ted Krim, has helped us out with this initiative and reached out and worked with the university and Dean Kurasina on bringing this individual here. We are gonna, we're gonna have a number of events. Bill, I don't know if it's been, I'm, I'm guessing it's not quite finalized, it will be soon. We'll make sure the information gets out to you because there, I'm, I'm, I believe we're planning on an open forum, but we're also planning on the ability of our, social, uh, our, our sociologists to visit in a more intimate setting, and our students to visit in a more intimate setting with this individual. This is a bit of a coup. This is a bit of a coup for, for A&M Commerce, bringing, with, bringing someone with this status to our university. So please, please uh, be on the lookout for this particular uh, uh, event. Another event that I want to make note of is that we have found our 11th football game. And it, it's an unexpected uh, opponent. We're actually getting, we're playing an opponent from Mexico, Selección Nuevo León. I was probably about 75% with that, okay? But it's, it's, a, it's a team that's coming up. Uh, I just lifted this off of Yahoo Sports. I could go to USA Today, sports and so forth and find the same type of thing. We're getting a little bit of play on this. And I, I, I'm interested in this game. I think it's gonna be a great game. But I also like, I've challenged our student affairs and, and the athletic department to help us be able to leverage this event to create opportunities for our students, and in particular our Hispanic students, to rub shoulders with key individuals. So for example, we've invited, and it's on his schedule, um, is the uh, Mexican General Consulate who will be joining us for this game. Also Domingo Garcia from uh, LULAC, right? Did I'm saying that right? LULAC, who will, the president, national organization, will be joining us. And we currently have it on Senator Corrin's schedule. So we're probably going to need three uh, coins to toss before the game, but we'll figure that out. Okay? So I'm really excited about this event to bring, to mesh this and this nexus of athletics and academics together for a single event. Uh, we are going to uh, reestablish or we're going to continue on with our faculty and staff ticket program uh, by the generosity of the provost. And you can see the details here. You can claim up to four tickets for free. 
Uh, you need to do that at least by 5 o'clock of the, the day before, I, I believe, the game or the Thursday before the game to claim your tickets. This has been successful in the past. I think it's, a, a, again, very generous of the provost to help us out with this. And I, and I hope you would go out and, and support our student athletes. Very, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Please know when I, when I take a step back and I talk about going to a student event, I'm including this. This is a great opportunity to show our support. Okay, this is where a little eclectic comes in play here. But I did have to announce this. So um, Senate Bill 212, which deals with reporting requirements for Title IX violations, okay? Not a very nice segue from athletics to this, but um, Title IX violations. And this is a memo that was issued by the system office. And we'll make this memo available to anyone. We'll probably, hopefully, Linda, we can post it on, online. But this is ex incredibly important because there's certain and intentional language in this bill, okay? And the first one in the upper right says, under the bill, an employee who knowingly fails to make a report of a title, potential Title IX violation must have his or her employment terminated. Okay? That seems pretty cut and dry to me. And I hope folks understand that even if someone comes to you and says, here's what happened, but, but please don't tell anyone, you're still obligated to report it. Or if you hear it from a, a third hand or second hand, you still need to report it under potential penalty under this bill, okay? In addition, there may be, uh, there are criminal penalties if an employee knowingly fails to admit a report or submit a report or, or makes a false report. And then they're gonna, the coordinating board's gonna hold the university uh, accountable for this. And if there's any uh, mix-ups or uh, not being reported properly, the, university, the coordinating board may uh, assess up to a $2 million fine to the university. Those of that know me well enough kind of adverse to a $2 million fine, so let's not do that. So we have to, uh, we have to make sure that we, we keep this in, in strict order, and we're gonna work with the university community to further promote this. Okay, so this is where I get to brag a little bit, okay? Sometimes I don't think we show enough swagger at this university. I look up and down the ranks of our staff and our faculty, and I see great people and great, great things are happening at this university that are being translated and, and being acknowledged at the national level, okay? First of all, just a couple of these. Our online uh, bachelor's degree in business analytics was ranked nationally by the bestschools.org. That's a tremendous honor and a tremendous, uh, uh, absolutely, <laughs> tremendous by our, our, that department. So get this, when you take the U.S. News and World Report's rankings came out for 2019, and Dan Sue has done a great job uh, sifting through the data and so forth. AM Commerce, under the ranking of national universities, 312, only 312 universities found their way to the ranking. We found our, we found our way between the 230 to 301 ranking in the nation by U.S. News and World Reports. And look how we knocked it out of the park in a number of different areas. And Dan Sue is crunching the numbers now, but she has indicated she's pretty sure that uh, there's not too many schools in Texas that has, that has the breadth and depth of acknowledgement that we have in this table. So that is a big kudo, kudo to you, and job well done. So good job on that. <clears throat> KTR won the uh, Edward R. Murrow Award. This is a big deal. And it was, it was awarded for a documentary on race relations in Grand Saline. Jared, Jared Knight and his group did a great job. This, I believe it was back in two, December 2018 when, the, when this document, uh, documentary ran. I can't tell you how impressed I am by that and what a big deal this is for the university. So KTR, good job. Jared, good job on that. <clears throat> we have a major event going on, that is, and it's down in Dallas. And I just wanted to bring it to your attention. The Sister Suffragists event 
is, is an event that, uh, as indicated here, is a celebration of the movement that brought uh, suffrage to women of Texas and the nation. And if you, you can read more information on this on the website and so forth, there is now an exhibition at the Bullock Museum in Dallas. And you see who one of the sponsors are here, Texas A&M Commerce. It's a big deal. Fortunately, we have a scholar in this area, uh, Dr. Jessica Brandon Rowski. And here's Jessica and her finest serving on a panel for the kickoff of this particular uh, exhibition. Jessica has played a central role in this, a big player in this, and she has indicated she is willing and interested in bringing this entire uh, effort for information purposes to campus, in part to celebrate the 100 year anniversary for this and, and, and really create this dialogue on, on, on the suffragists at A&M Commerce. So Jessica, I don't know if you're here today, but great job on that. Thank you. I can talk for quite a while about the prowess of our athletic teams and the success we've had on the field and in the gym, the national championships in track, the volleyball championships and so forth, all these special things that happened over the year. But I elected not to do that because although I'm very proud of those kind of things, the buttons on, me, on my chest really burst when I see at things like this where 139 lines named to the Lone Star Conference Commissioner's Honor Roll for spring of 2019 with 51 perfect GPAs. That is absolutely <laughs> tremendous. Other schools can't hold a candle to that. And you can, you can give a lot of kudos to the athletic department. It, you know, Tim McMurray and Judy Saffield, Victoria, and, all, and everyone who works in the Thrower Center is, is doing a great job, and this is testimony to that. But I also want to give a shout out to the coaches and assistant coaches that serve not only, they simultaneously serve as coach, mentor, advisor, friend, a shoulder. We have the, I believe we have the best coaching staff, certainly in D2, and I'd pit it up against anyone in the nation. So Tim, uh, the athletic folks, good job on that. <clears throat> Who knew that we had a fishing club? Anyone know that we had a fishing club? I just found this out a little while ago. This is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> my wife and the kids and I went fishing at Texoma, bass fishing, we had a great time. We came back and found out about this and we're like, this is the coolest thing ever. And it's only been in existence for two years. And over those two years, now they're, they've ramped up so fast that now they're competing in national championships, bass fishing championships. And get this, they recruited the top two high school anglers in the state to come here at a and Commerce. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. These two gentlemen right here, Jacob and Michael, are the founders of this, of this program. And they have done a great job. And I'm, you can tell I'm kind of enamored by this. I can't really tell you exactly why. I just think it's really cool. Okay, but good job. But this is indicative of all the different student clubs we have at our university. So you've been clapping a lot. I'll give your hands a break here because we've got to go into the legislative session. Okay. <laughs> so just relax and kick back for a little bit. Um, Let me tell you the first not so good, okay? We didn't do so well in getting our uh, new formula items funded. For example, the Rural Mental Health Initiative. This one kind of hurts, okay? We did a lot of leg work. Uh, we did a lot of work, Matt and, and Humphreys and Nick Batras and so forth, did a lot of work in grooming the legislature for this. It just simply did not work out. We also did not get, there were no TRBs, tuition revenue bonds that were funded across the entire state. And we, we tried to make the case how, how important this ag research and education uh, center is that was our TRB request and how it could transform a and Commerce and transform East Texas. Still didn't get it funded. But again, that was across the board. So 
we're going to try to hit that again because we really do think it's so incredibly important. And then we didn't receive any additional institutional enhancement funding. Okay? There were some schools that were able to find, legislators were able to find some pots of money to offset any kind of enrollment decreases, any kind of hardship the university has. There were a lot of schools in the A&M system that found that money. We were not one of them. We got a little bit of work to do. Okay? The good is that we preserved competency-based education funding. That's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. I'm glad we did that. That's an important, extremely front and center initiative at this university. We also received an increase in formula funding at a tune of about $600,000 a year. That's not because our enrollment went up. It's because the legislature put more money into the formula funding. Okay? We lucked out. Okay? We lucked out. But still, it's better than the alternative. And so we have this about $600,000 that's, that's out there. And we need to decide what to do with it. Well, the decision's been made on that. We're going to take the whole WAD and we're going to implement a merit increase this year for faculty and staff. So, yeah. It's not a lot of money. It amounts to maybe about a 1%. But we have to keep a close eye on enrollment for the fall and see if we can bump that up. Okay? But we're also going to do a little bit of work of shortening the pool a little bit. And so if you shorten the number of people or reduce the number of people in the pool, uh, you can maybe that 1% becomes 1.3, 1.5, 2%, whatever that may be. And so uh, here are the people that are not going to be eligible for merit in this next year. Those who have been employed at the university for less than six months, that's in our policy. Those have, re have recently received equity or merit adjustments of, su of substance. Okay? I sign a lot of, of salary increases coming across my, uh, across my desk. I'm going to ask the VPs and the deans and, and the provosts to take a good look at that list. And if someone's received like a 10% increase or a equity adjustment or whatever that may be, we have to look at that again. Those with non-satisfactory performance or no performance plan or no performance evaluations on file will not be included in this pool. And no one on the executive team is going to be eligible for this money either. So that's where we stand right now. We're asking Tina Livingston and Alicia to, uh, to crunch the numbers and see what that comes up with. The only issue is, is that we're going to kind of look again at the fall enrollment and see if we can squeeze more money out of this. Okay? So given that, we may not be able to implement this until October, November. But, we're going to give it, but for sure, we're committed to at least the 1%. Okay? Enrollment. This is the current status of where we are in terms of enrollment. It may, that might be a little bit difficult to see, and I apologize to you. But where we are as of yesterday is that compared where we were uh, last year at this time, we're down about 446 students, about 3% decrease, okay, 3.6. Just as important, if not more important, we're down about 0.2% in our credit hours, hybrid credit hours. Okay, this number, these, both of these numbers are a little volatile. We have a little bit of work to do. We have until the 20th day to continue growing it. I meet, I'm constantly on uh, Lee Young's back to give me numbers every day, and what are we doing, what are we doing? And Jen Schroeder, who both have really stepped up big time to help us out. And I do want to talk about strategies to move forward in terms of enrollment. And I just want to highlight this real quick, because I'm going to come back to this. I want you to take a look at the sophomores the difference between 18 and 19. We're down 57 sophomores, 181 seniors, and 300, 405 graduate students. So a total of over 600 of these students. I want to come back to that in a second. So here's some accomplishments over the last year. We had a new workload policy. That was a result of, I, I visited a, the, the various depart academic departments on campus heard the crushing workload that was out there and that our faculty face on a continual basis. As a result, we came up with a new policy. Is it perfect? Nope. 
but it does leave it in the hands of the departments to decide and negotiate and work on workload at an individual department by department basis. I plan on coming back and visiting with people in the various departments to continue this dialogue and further the discussion about implementation of this. Establishment of a new college, CID, College of Innovation and Design. We have a little bit of work to do of explaining exactly what this college is. What this college is not is something that says, this college is, innovation, is innovative, no one else is. That's not what this college is about. Okay? First and foremost, it afforded us an opportunity to combine all our CBE into one college. And from an academic preparation, marketing, and so forth, that is tremendously beneficial. But we also have an opportunity of a college that is degree granting to experiment with things. Okay? Experiment. Higher ed is set up. You pass or you fail. Okay? I want to try things. I don't want to break the bank. I don't want to be foolish from a fiscal standpoint. But we need to try and experiment and, and leverage our expertise to think out of the box and create new opportunities. Okay? Even if programs are developed in CID, okay, eventually, most likely, they'll find their way to a college. Okay? It's a way to incubate and try new ideas at, that academics typically kind of shy away from a tad. You know, I had an opportunity, and she's going to kill me when I tell you this, but I had an opportunity to have lunch with Erin Harper, who is a faculty member in psychology. And, and she is, uh, I've had the opportunity to work with people that are taking DNA and scaffolding and creating computers with human DNA. And I've had people that have developed traction on wheels to take to the moon. But I think what, what, what Erin Harper's doing is just as cool as that, okay? She is, she is a person that is, has, has a lot of expertise and experience in helping uh, underprivileged African-American, I believe young women, uh, Aaron, um, to help them out along their way. But she understands that you need a toolkit to make that happen. You need expertise to make that happen. And this is where part she's going to kill me. But what folks don't know is that Aaron also has a side gig as improv comedy, comedy down in Dallas. Absolutely. She knows how to make, tell stories. They may be funny stories, but she knows how to tell stories. And so she, when she's sitting across, or the social worker's sitting across from a, someone, and they are reaching into their toolkit and trying to improvise, what, what steps do I need to take? What story do I need to tell? How do I approach this? Aaron is interested in developing programming and research that helps that person, that social worker, that psychology person, that counselor, whoever that may be, again, to broaden, diversify their skill set and their toolkit. Okay? That is an example of a program that we can potentially run within CID, where it's a combination of social work, counseling, communication, psycho uh, psychology folks that come together and let's experiment, perhaps with graduate, cer uh, graduate certificate. Okay? That's, that's what I'm talking about. And we're going we're gonna to continue to have this dialogue on campus as the year proceeds. Okay? But that's a quintessential example of what a CID can do. Okay? Sorry, Aaron. I just think whatever you're doing is cool. So that's great. Okay? Uh, we completed an evaluation of the leadership and the academic affairs side of the house uh, that, was, that was administered by faculty senate. It, I think it was, uh, I, I was going to say it was success. That remains to be seen. Because if we do the evaluation and the deans and the provosts and the chairs, whoever had that information that's put on the shelf, then it was a complete waste of time. Okay? I've challenged the provost and the academic affairs side of the house. I want a dialogue with the faculty and the staff within your colleges. This is what I heard you say. This is what I'm going to do. Okay? We need to have that exchange, the, the evaluation is worthless if we don't try to correct any issues that need to be correcting or advance any positive issues that need advancing. Okay? That was the purpose of the evaluation. And then finally, a new strategic plan was put together. And I'd like to thank uh, Dean Shannon Gibson and uh, Dr. Robert Rodriguez for leading this effort. And we're going to have a new strategic plan starting now. And we have copies of this that are going to be handed to you outside uh, as you leave the place. This is going to be our roadmap to the university. 
This is what we're going to do for the next uh, five years at the university. I'm excited about it. Marcom did a great job on putting this together. I'm super impressed that it's a simple, straightforward plan that anyone can understand and say, okay, I can see what they're doing here, okay? I'm, I can't tell you how pleased I am how it, how it turned out. Um, if, as you leaf through the pages, it talks about our pillars, our foundational principles of um, transformative, innovation, inclusive, and sustainable. I'm really excited about those. I'm also excited about our strategic goals and priorities. Uh, many of you have heard me talk, unfortunately, ad nauseum about student preparedness and how we have to start thinking about a, as a campus to properly prepare our students to be successful in their jobs, their first job and subsequent jobs. And I think sometimes I hear whispers of, oh, will you turn us, us into a vocational college, Mark? No, that's not it at all. I'm a firm believer in the liberal arts core and so forth, regardless of discipline, developing the well-rounded person. But I think we do ourselves and our, particularly our students a disservice if we don't understand what potential employers expect in terms of skills of our graduates. We are gonna have that dialogue with industry. We're gonna have that dialogue with the campus. If I can take a moment, and, and I won't go through all these, if I can take a moment, what I want to focus on just for a little bit today is research, okay? Why? Why are we doing this? I'm busy. I got a lot of work to do. It's hard. We don't have the infrastructure in place to support what I need to do, okay? I get that. Research is hard. Funded research is really hard, okay? It is CeCe Gassner's job to create the infrastructure to help faculty and make it easier to do research, make it easier to do funded research. I think I would, I'd, I'd be in the same boat you are. If we sit, flipped on the switch and said, tomorrow start, start submitting grants, no way. Can't do that with your workloads. Can't do that without the proper support structure in place. But CC is hard at work, and the OSP people are hard at work to create those services, those research development services to you to, to advance research at this university. Okay? Elevating the research profile of the university benefits the university. Let's face it, when we start comparing universities, the prestige of universities, universities and, and the, the academy jumps the research immediately. How do you compare research-wise? What are your research numbers and so forth? Okay? Also, there's an economic development component to this. I want that Ag Expo Center located through the, with the TRB south of town here, okay? I want that. I want to create those opportunities for our students. But the econo research economic de development guy in me says, I want the research done there also. I want the benefits of doing research there. I want us to partner with industry. Not only am I interested in the, in the TRB and that building, I'm interested in partnering with companies and lo and behold, maybe we can get companies that start cropping up around that center ag companies, business companies, agribusiness, and so forth. I think we're given an opportunity to make that happen if we, can, if we can start advancing research at this university. Research also benefits, funded research also benefits faculty. I remember when I was a faculty, last thing I wanted to do was, can I have some money for travel, please? Okay, I need to present at conferences. How do I do that? I don't have any money. The budget, the department budget is minuscule. University doesn't have a pool of money for, for faculty and students to attend research conferences, to disseminate their information. We have work to do in that area, okay? But if you could write a grant and get funding, you, don't, you can't believe how liberating that is. You're calling the shots. You're interacting with the sponsor. You have responsibilities back home with the university and accountability there. But if you're in your grant, you got to, you tell the sponsor you want you need to go on X number of trips, or you need to hire X number of students, or you need to do this, that, or the other thing. You have money to do that. Okay, it gives you the flexibility. And then finally, students. Students will be at the center and at the core of the research we do here at the university. I want us to take as we advance this initiative. Let's get students front and center 
in all research that we're doing. Data shows, particularly in the STEM areas, but across all areas, that students that participate in research have a greater retention rate, higher GPA, and greater skill development. And if you need to, I can show you studies on that, okay? Research teaches you skills that you don't necessarily get in the lab or the gallery or the stage or whatever that may be, okay? It, it, it starts to give you skill, life skills of failure, okay? That didn't go right. I gotta dust off my britches and make it right, okay? I think students need to learn that. And I don't want this discussion to pit teaching against research, okay? Those are not mutually exclusive things. Collectively, whether you're in the lab or in the classroom, it's all about student learning. And I would say that learning happens in the studio, the classroom, the lab, the field, wherever that may be. And that's what we're gonna focus on at this university. And finally, writing grants and getting opportunities for funding to come in also benefits and provides financial support and we can hire students doing that type of work and really help out with this whole financial aid piece that is so important at the university. We're hitting this hard, okay? Okay, recent, and I think we have a good core of researchers that already know how to do this. It may be we want to open this up and create opportunities across the board. But we do have a lot of folks, and congratulations to these folks that are getting some pretty high profile grants at a, at a national level, okay? I just wanted to bring your attention to a project that is going on within our Center of Excellence in the College of Business. Frank Thomas, Mohammed Kamaki, this is exactly what I'm hoping for, okay? They went out to Farmersville to look at how, looking at a study and doing a survey of broadband needs in Farmersville, okay? And Farmersville came up with money and they said, we'll fund you to do this study. And the money is used to fund students that are conducting the study. So here you have, look at our, some of our goals at the strategic plan of student involvement, alignment with the community, elevating research, all nicely packaged into a project. And if you talk to Frank and Mohammed, their end game here is to certainly do the work and, and create a nice product for Farmersville, but to also position themselves for a USDA grant in partnership with Farmersville. They have the necessary data in hand to go after the grant money. Okay. I hope we do, I hope we listen to this and really think about these type of opportunities to grow research at our university. Okay. Diversity and inclusion. Um, this has been a topic that I've, I've always, I've, I'm gonna to continue to discuss. This is an initiative that is not gonna go away at this university. We're gonna to continue to have this dialogue. And I can't tell you how happy I am with the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee run, uh, headed up by Dr. Fred Fuentes and the work they are doing, okay? They have come a long way. They have resurrected the discussion. We have some great folks on that, on that committee. They are doing some hard work. They're doing some heavy lifting. And one of the things they did last spring is they had some open forums where students, faculty, staff could just come in and, and tell us your perceptions and view of DEI at A&M Commerce. And, the, and I, I sat in on one of them. In fact, one of them were here, was held here. And the committee members were just sitting on the stage, didn't respond. That was purposeful. There was a lot of questions. Well, why didn't you guys say something? You know, there were some raw feelings, some raw nerves in the, in the building, okay? But a lot of information came from those, those sessions. And thanks for the good work of uh, Dr. Julia Ballinger and Fred and the group and so forth. They came out and distilled out three things, three themes that they saw at, at our university. They saw a disproportionate level of diversity and executive leadership and faculty and staff and so forth. When I sit down and talk to organizations like Sister to Sister and MDA and so forth, the Hispanic group, sometimes they, seniors are telling me I haven't had one person of color as an instructor throughout my entire career, okay? That's problematic, okay? They've also talked about a general lack of acceptance of diverse cultures at this university. 
that perhaps people, not that they are trying to understand, well, maybe that's it, maybe not even trying to understand someone else's point of view, someone else's experiences, okay? And then the last one, incivility and lack of trust. So this is nice, but what's the action, okay? So we have identified, we're sort of chintzing out on this, because I told the committee that we can't do, you can't take everything on at once. I think the discussion about how do we increase diversity in, in ranks of our faculty and staff and administration, let's continue to have that discussion. But the uh, diverse cultures and the incivility, we have two major initiatives that are going on. And the first one is we are gonna initiate cultural intelligence training, okay? Gonna kind of test drive this. And we're gonna have uh, Dr. Marianne Magjuki from Wake Forest to come and, and hold the first one of these type of events, training events. And we're just piloting this right now. It's gonna be temporarily held, or it is gonna be held on September 10th and 11th. You can see the participants. We have a mixture of executive team and admin council, campus life, the committee, and then faculty representatives. I wanted to get faculty representatives that have expertise in this area to help us assess the, uh, the value of this training and how appropriate this training was and so forth. But we are going to, if this is a success and we're happy with Marianne, we're going to expand this and continue to have this type of training across the university. Okay, this is very important. Um, and then the, the lack of civility and mistrust. So if I kind of just speak from the heart here, we have a lot of challenges at this university. The AM system's not down there ready to write us a $500 million check. The legislature is not saying, oh, how can we help you out, AM Commerce? Okay? We have a donor base that, it, although willing and able, maybe can't compete with other large institutions. We have a lot of challenges that we need to band together to confront. But when you start creating discourse amongst each other and divisions amongst each other, we're not on the same page. We're not on the same page at all, okay? I get, e every week I get emails of people that say, you know what? I may get fired because I'm sending you this, but here's what I'm seeing, or here's what I experienced. And I'm just so incredulous when I get that. And to a person, I write back and say, I'd be worthless as a president if we didn't have that dialogue. You should always feel free to contact me. You should always feel, we should always be in a situation. And I know that's not the case. I know that there's a bit of a culture here that says, I don't want my head chopped off if I, if, I, if I go to someone else. There may be retribution if I go somewhere else, okay? We can't have that. We can't have that. And so I've challenged our leadership team to be able to, I, I, I don't think this is just a, a it is a kind of a general problem, but I've challenged our folks to, to the, the leadership, the deans, the VPs, and so forth, and I told them, I want you to drill down in your respective organizations. I want you to have a finger on the pulse of what's going on within your individual divisions. I want to know, I want you to know if there's cases of incivility, and I want you to manage that. I don't want you to shove it aside. I want you to proactively manage those situations. Okay. Now, don't get me wrong. I know there's cases when could be parents, outside people come to me, and believe me, I'm getting an airful, and I'm getting this, right? And sometimes it's hard to keep your cool, okay? And I know that oftentimes when, when I get emails from people that it's, I, I may not get, be getting the entire story. But if you, even if half the stories are true about the lack of kindness at our university, that's too many. And even if you get a knucklehead 
in your office that is misbehaving. I think we need training or some kind of action to help you better manage that situation. Okay? We need to actively manage civility on our campus. Because I'll be darned if every faculty, staff, administ administrative assistant, and student does not have a seat at this table and is treated in a respectful and civil manner. That's our end game at this university. And if we can't achieve that, or you don't feel you can achieve that, a and Commerce may not be for you. And in many ways, there may, you may be cut out of the herd, because we're hitting this full force. And it isn't going to be me that cuts you out of the herd. It's going to be your peers cutting you out of the herd, saying, we don't act like that. We don't do that anymore at a and Commerce. And so. I, I, I don't think I'm articulating this very well because I, I, it's difficult for me to relate. It bothers me so much when people say, I can't come to you because I'll get in trouble back at the homestead. I can beg you to come to me. I can beg you to go to your supervisor, but we need to change this, okay? And so I'm so happy that Lavelle Edwards, as a subcommittee of the DEI committee, is taking on the civility charge. And we're having this new initiative, the Civility Evolution Initiative. I almost got that, I think, Lavelle, but I'm not sure. And so the committee is already up and going. We're putting a full court press on this. One of the first steps they had is they had this commitment statement that we are going to be a civil institution and treat each other in a civil manner. Okay. You'll, you'll see more of this as it comes about. We're going to have all kinds of programming that is going to be going on throughout the year that I hope you participate in. And the, one of the first things out of the block is a survey that's going to work to assess civility on our campus. Let you have your say anonymously to tell the story so we can start look at that information and craft the strategy from this point forward. You're going to have your say in this thing. And I hope when you see the civility survey come out, and it'll, it'll come out most likely from our partner in this, Dale Carnegie, that we enlisted their help to do this, I, I, I urge you to respond to that survey. Please know that I, we have a lot of great people at this university. And I understand just for the last five minutes I, put, I painted a, bra a broad brush on this, okay? I trust that we're gonna, we're gonna, as an institution, we have the fortitude to be able to pull this off. We have great shirts, too. I was going to wear this shirt today, but I didn't get it. We're, we have a team of civility ambassadors that are going to uh, uh, be wearing these shirts and promoting civility on campus. Uh, I hope we can distribute more and more of these shirts as, as we produce goodwill to, to one another. Okay? I'm still waiting for the DEI committee to come up with a couple statements here. Statement of shared values and statement of diversity and inclusion. I would really like to see these two documents crafted that tells us what is important to us, what are our core values in terms of shared values at the university and, and for DNI. Okay, new initiatives. Okay, I need to go through this a little bit quick because I think I'm running out of time. Okay, new initiatives for 2019 2020. Enrollment, enrollment, enrollment. Okay, while you're off, while you're off doing research and teaching classes and so forth, I want you to know that we have assembled a team that has been incredibly busy over the, over the last summer months, okay? Reaching out to independent school districts in the area, okay? Establishing a relationship with those school districts. We want your students to become lions. We want to incentivize your students to become lions. These are the school districts we visited over the last three or four months. And we have a team put together of myself, Provost, Ron Price, who's been extremely invaluable in this process. Ron, thank you so much. We have two new people that are helping us out, serving as liaisons to these school districts. Abby Harper and Danielle Davis, thank you very much for all your efforts. We are hitting this hard. We think we want enrollment and recruitment to be less about let's throw the fishing line out there and see what we can do. 
and make it about relationships. And I think we're making headway in this area. It's not gonna be impactful, I don't think, until next summer and next fall. So real quick, we are throwing things out there like a pledge, a pledge statement. Much like our relationship with the Dallas Promise, okay? Where the Promise says, hey, if you're a high school kid and you're, you're going to school in the Dallas system, you, if you sign up for the Promise, you get two years of free tuition at a community college and then free year, two years of free tuition at a uh, four-year institution. We are now part of that. But we came back thinking, hey, if we can do that for two years, why can't we do that for four years and grab kids right out of high school? And they have to meet certain criteria. We don't want to bust the bank. But if they meet certain criteria and they're Pell eligible kids, we think we can stack scholarships on top of each other and let Lee work his magic with financial aid to create complete packages for these kids. That's one of the messages we're selling. Another one is, is uh, uh, Quick Start. We're reaching out and saying, we want you and your faculty at these uh, high schools to come out and have a uh, uh, get, pursue your master's degree at the university. Okay? We're willing to offer up $1,000 or $500 grants. And the last one is a quick start program, or I'm sorry, a rising lion program, where, and I won't get into too much of this, but you're going to hear more about it, is that we're going to target trying to get kids, trying to get a cohort of students here for summer session two to start their education at A&M Commerce in July. And I'm really excited about that, and you'll learn more about that. Okay, new, other new initiatives. Education and Agricultural Academies in Dallas, okay? Texas A&M has done a great job where they have placed faculty at community colleges across the state, ed, engineering faculty, okay? We, wanna, we want that model for A&M Commerce. We replace education and ag faculty at select community colleges and have those students take their core at the community college, but take required classes at, at the community colleges and then have those kids matriculate, come over to A&M Commerce. More about that. College of Ag, we, we have a great research partner in the system of AgriLife Dallas that do tremendous research. We are in discussions with them right now, how do we com combine talents? We take the lead in, in teaching, they take the lead in research, we help each other out, and we create ag opportunities in the Metroplex, and particularly urban ag. We are a big, important partner at RELIS. RELIS is a model down in Bryan and College Station where kids that don't get in the Texas A&M system that are still uh, university, are still tremendous students that go into Blinn College are now can be part and matriculate over to A&M Commerce, but headquartered down in RELIS. It's gonna be an exciting initiative. Expand competency-based education. Come on. Explore new innovative acad graduate academic programming. I hear, I'm hearing more and more from industry saying, we don't have the time, the money, or the energy to, for someone to complete an MBA, okay? We don't have that, that type of money anymore. But if you can get our people in and out of there for nine credits here or six credits here for a credential, let's talk. So I'm interested, I'm interested in, and excited to have this discussion with Jennifer Schroeder. Student success teams. We're going to, we're formulating this now. Those, remember I, I told you to uh, bookmark those 600 plus students of sophomores and so forth that we don't know what, where they are right now. And that's the problem. We don't know where they are. We don't know what they're doing. Why are we, why do we have 400 graduate students and over 100 seniors that we don't know what they're doing? No one's had a discussion with them. We're calling them up and saying, hey, how's it going? We need to have intrusive advising for those students and get to know the student so we don't even get to this point and help us with retention and understand the mindset and identify flags within our student body of I gotta follow up with these guys. These guys are good over here, okay? You'll see more and more of student success teams. We're gonna conduct an evaluation of the, of the executive leadership, all the VPs, athletic director, much like the faculty senate conducted that evaluation for uh, the academic affairs side of the house. We're gonna ask, ask staff council, 
uh, to administer that for all the VPs. So I'm really, and that's going to happen, I believe, this fall. So I encourage you to participate in that exercise also, because I think that's extremely healthy to do that. We're having a discussion right now about the eventuality of a capital comprehensive campaign at this university to have a focused, intentional effort to raise money to advance initiatives at this university. We are in the, kind of the, the, the groundwork stage right now, but eventually, you, you better believe we're gonna, we're gonna work to make progress on that, and you will be called into those discussions if you haven't been already. Communicate. I've heard I need to communicate better. I've heard, and I'm guilty of this, I'm heard, I've heard that I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you guys. Why, why didn't I know about this stuff before, Mark? When are you gonna start reaching out to us and letting us know what's happening here? And so I, I would welcome any thoughts you all have of the best mechanisms to do that. Newsletter, president's letter, open forums, I, I, I'll meet you any place you wanna go, okay? But I'm gonna, we're gonna try this, we're gonna make a concerted effort at a minimum, a monthly basis, to give you an update from my perspective, from my office, of what's going on at the university. I'm committed to that, we're gonna continue, we're gonna start that immediately. And then finally, I can't tell you how happy I am about this. This is an A&M Commerce Teaching Academy that's gonna be run by Jennifer Dyer over in the College of Education to help us train to be better teachers. Where's Jennifer, good job, absolutely. I understand that we serve a student body that is economically stressed. I understand that they may weave in and out of their academic progression throughout their career. We have to accommodate that. But I refuse to let students out of here based upon lack of performance or lack of excellence in the classroom. We have to make sure that we bring our best game into the classroom. And Jennifer, thank you so much for taking this on, and there'll be more information as we come about here. We need to do this because we have a new class of students coming into this university that are stellar and across the board. So for example, Naley, valedictorian of Cooper High School. You can see all of her credentials there. Javon Martinez, poor Javon only has a 3.83 GPA coming from Louisville, which is a little heftier than mine and Buddy Barnes' GPA when we were in high school, but uh, um, another stellar student. We have Carissa, who's a biology major that I just had the opportunity to meet personally at BioPride, a program that the biology department puts on for incoming biology majors. Also valedictorian of Sulphur Springs. And then finally Harrison, who's valedictorian from um, uh, Sulphur Bluff, Texas. These are, these are the people. This is the new face. This is the new class of folks that you're, we're going to deal with. We need to do everything we can to bring our A game to campus this year and do everything we possibly can to do that. Again, we have challenges at this university. We have a lot of challenges. But I don't want you to push the challenges aside. I don't want you to ignore the challenges. I want you to embrace the challenges. I want you to be part of the solution. And if you don't feel like you can be part of the solution, but someone who reports to you can, step out of the way and let them help. We need to band together as a lion family to advance this university. And in many cases, you're gonna lead. In many cases, I'm gonna lead. But we can't do it without each other. So please, take those words to heart and let's, let's band together again as a Lion family. I congratulate you on everything you do at this university. I wish you a successful year, and go Lions. Thank you very much. Thank you.